I knew that one day it would be time to leave the cities. That one day God would send some sort of a sign and then we would know that it was time to get out. But when you see that the sign has already come, it's a real wake-up call. When you realize that time is running out, that soon people won't be able to get out of these cities, you finally come to the point where you say, okay, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get my family out. It's a prediction made by Christ himself nearly 2,000 years ago, a prophecy with special significance to Christians living right now. When therefore ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. A growing number of students of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are recognizing the fulfillment of this prophecy, the appearance of the abomination of desolation. More and more are now heeding the warning and leaving the urban areas for quiet, secluded homes in the country. Meanwhile, life in the city is becoming more and more perilous. Terrorist attacks on cities in recent years remind us of the vulnerability of the large centers of population. The potential for epidemic disease is mounting, along with the dangers of infectious spread through water and air filtration systems. Thousands perish in a day as earthquakes, fires, and floods strike when least expected. And yet, the scenes we have witnessed are only a small taste of what's coming, as disaster and destruction will fall upon the great cities of the world. But God has a plan to deliver His people from the powerful forces about to be unleashed on the earth. He is now calling His people to leave cities for isolated homes secluded in the mountains. In these retired places, they will find a quiet retreat to commune with Him. These men and women will develop such a character that God can use them to carry the last great warning to the world. We've been in a window of opportunity to heed the warning, but that window is closing. Every Christian needs to understand this issue. I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 15. We read these words, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now this prophecy of Jesus has two applications. One referring to the destruction of Jerusalem and one referring to our own day. And we're going to see why that is from Scripture in a moment. But this prophecy has special significance to you and I because in understanding this prophecy, you and I can understand how it is that we would know what the signal is that we should look for that would tell us that it's time to get out of the cities. And that's pretty important to know, isn't it? God's people need to know that. Jesus went to great pains to give us a prophecy so that we would know that. And that's because of this dual application, the application of this in our day. And if we're going to understand it, we've got to have help from the Lord Jesus to do that. And I appreciate my brother Brad Neely who led us in prayer. And I feel the need to pray again right now and just ask the Holy Spirit to help us as we study. So would you just pause, please, as we do that? Dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is for us to open your word, a message from heaven. Lord, I pray that nothing about 
me or my personality would get in the way today. I don't want a moment to be wasted, so please help us. In the Word, we read that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so please send us the Holy Spirit. Send your angels to hover about this place and keep the enemy far away, who is the author of confusion. And help us to have clarity in our thoughts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I say that this has two applications. It's what we call a dual prophecy. And and to understand that better, if we back up a few verses to chapter 23, we'll get a little background, and that helps us to understand why this is so. Jesus was in the temple, and he spoke these awful words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And with those words ringing in the ears of the disciples, your house is left unto you desolate as they walked out of the temple. For if we keep reading in Matthew 24, here's what it says. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And notice, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Do you understand what's going on? He just said, your house is left unto you desolate, but they're looking at the magnificent structure before them, and they're saying, "Uh, uh, excuse me, Jesus, it doesn't look desolate. They showed him the buildings. And notice as we keep reading, Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Boy, he didn't lighten the burden, did he? And as we'll see as we keep reading, these words continued to roll around in their minds. And so notice what we find. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And I hope you catch something here. The temple was so magnificent to the disciples that when he when Jesus said your house is left unto you desolate when he said there shall not be left here one stone upon another all that they could figure is he must be talking about the end of the world surely this temple would never be destroyed short of the end of the world and so they're still thinking about all this and they're sitting with Jesus and they said tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world They're asking a very interesting question. They think that the temple is going to be destroyed when Jesus comes back the second time. And now Jesus did something very merciful to them. He didn't say, well, boys, actually, the temple is going to be destroyed, but I'm not coming for hundreds of years. Wouldn't that have been discouraging? And so, out of mercy, he did something that only the divine mind can do. He gave a prophecy that would apply both to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and to the end of the world all in one prophecy. Now, isn't that amazing? Only the divine mind could do that. And so, as we read on in Matthew 24, we find a list of signs. And those signs apply to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and they also apply to the end of the world equally. And I want to read to you just a little bit from the book Great Controversy where this is written so graphically, how these signs apply. This is Great Controversy, page 29. Signs and wonders appeared, foreboding disaster and doom. In the midst of the night, an unnatural light shone over the temple and the altar. Upon the clouds at sunset were pictured chariots and men of war gathering for battle. The priests ministering by night in the sanctuary were terrified by mysterious sounds. The earth trembled and a multitude of voices were heard crying, Let us depart hence. The great eastern gate, which was so heavy that it could hardly be shut by a score of men and which was secured by immense bars of iron fastened deep in the pavement of solid stone, opened at midnight without visible agency. 
For seven years, a man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. By day and by night, he chanted the wild dirge, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and against the temple, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, a voice against the whole people. This strange being, isn't that an interesting description of this man? This strange being was imprisoned and scourged, but no complaint escaped his lips. To insult and abuse, he answered only, Woe, woe to Jerusalem, woe, woe to the inhabitants thereof. His warning cry ceased not until he was slain in the siege he had foretold. By the way, it's interesting that right here in Great Controversy, I also read these words. All the predictions given by Christ concerning the destruction of Jerusalem were fulfilled to the letter. All those signs in Matthew 24 that we read when we have a, a good evangelistic sermon on the second coming and the signs of the return of Jesus. Now, you heard some of them there, the signs in the heavens. Did you hear it in the description? Even in the clouds at sunset were formed the images that looked like armies preparing for battle. And friend, you can be sure that all of the signs will be fulfilled to the letter again. And they are being fulfilled right before our very eyes, are they not? But I'm going to keep reading a great controversy because this next sentence is so important. It says, Not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Isn't that good news? Not one Christian. Why? Why did not one Christian perish in the destruction of Jerusalem? She tells us. I'll keep reading. Christ had given his disciples warning and all who believed his words watched for the promised sign. What was it? I read it at the beginning. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Remember what were Jesus' instructions? Flee to the mountains. Now what's interesting is right here in the book Great Controversy we keep reading and Mrs. White quotes one of the other Gospels. She quotes from Dr. Luke because in Luke 21, the parallel passage to that verse we started with, Matthew 24, 15, and 16. The parallel passage in Luke 21 has some additional information, and it's key to helping us understand what the meaning of the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place was. I'm just going to read it to you. Reading on out of great controversy. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, said Jesus, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the, to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Luke 21, 20, and 21. Now you say, wait a minute. How does Jerusalem being encompassed with armies have anything to do with the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place? Well, once again, I'm so thankful for the spirit of prophecy because we find the explanation. Here it is. Great Controversy, page 26. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. You see, when the Roman armies came to take Jerusalem, they had something that the old term for it is standards. We would call them banners or flags. And on those standards were images depicting the Roman gods. And you see, years before, this designation of holy ground outside the walls of Jerusalem had been made. In fact, if you want some interesting history on this, you can go back to Nehemiah chapter 13. You'll read about the Sabbath reforms for God's people, particularly there in Jerusalem, and you find an amazing story. There were pagan merchants that would come and encamp around the walls of Jerusalem over the Sabbath hours so that they could be ready to come into the city when the gates should be opened to sell their wares. And the prophet Nehemiah, now he was, he was quite a guy. He was a man's man kind of prophet. 
In fact, you can read the story where in, in one instance, Nehemiah actually changed some hairdos to make his point. And he didn't use scissors. Plucked out their hair. But in the case of these pagan merchants, he went out and told them, get out of here. Clear out of this area around the city walls on the Sabbath days. And he said he had to tell them not once or more than once or twice. And he finally told them, if you don't get out of here, I will bodily remove you. Wow. I'll tell you what a reproof to our namby-pamby ways these days, don't you think? Nehemiah was taking a stand. And so this area outside the walls of Jerusalem was designated the holy ground or the holy place. Not to be confused with the holy place in the sanctuary. Are you with me? And so here's the history there in Great Controversy. By the way, when the Roman armies came and planted those standards there, don't you think they knew what they were doing? They planted them right in the holy ground. They knew that it would be an affront to the Jews. They knew it would also state their intentions. They were going to take the city. And so they surrounded it with those standards, those signs with their pagan gods as a mark of what they were about to do. Well, interestingly enough, one day, for no apparent reason, the Roman armies withdrew. By the way, this siege was under a general named Cestius. And when they withdrew, when the Roman army withdrew, the Jewish army chased after them and almost routed them, which ended up to embolden them in their arrogance even more later on, which was a bad thing. But it was at that time when the Roman armies withdrew, Jesus' disciples in the city saw their moment of opportunity. You see, you've got to understand something. The disciples of Christ recognized the sign. The Roman armies were surrounding Jerusalem, but could they leave? They couldn't get out. They were under siege. But they watched. And when the Roman armies retreated and the Jewish armies chased after them, the Christians had an unhindered passage out of the city. And they fled to a place called Pella in the mountains. Now, What's interesting is that it was about three and a half years, which is an interesting number. About three and a half years passed before the Roman armies came back, this time under Titus. That was the second siege now. And the Roman armies would not retreat again before they would do their doleful work. And you can read the story in the book, Great Controversy. Titus tried to come to an agreement so that they could keep the battle away from the temple. But you know, we read in Great Controversy that even his own soldiers, those hardened, crusty soldiers, became infuriated at what they were witnessing happening in the city as women ate their own children women and men alike, as children would rip the tiny morsels of food out of the mouths of their aged parents, as people would sneak out of the city just to look for a little weed or something they could eat. We're told that, that the people would even gnaw on the leather of their sandals trying to get just some little morsel of nourishment. And people would risk their life to go out and grab a few weeds or herbs. And if they made it back into the city without getting caught and crucified, they'd get into the city and it'd be taken from them. And as the Roman soldiers witnessed the atrocities happening inside the city, they could not withhold themselves any longer. And they finally stormed the city. And Titus had instructed his men not to go to the temple, not to destroy the temple. And he lost control of his own soldiers. And we're told that blood flowed like water down the steps of the temple. And the shrieks and screams and the, the groaning of the timbers as they broke and caved in amidst all the fiery flames. The destruction of Jerusalem. Well, how does this help us today? What do we learn from the story today? 
once again, I turn to the spirit of prophecy where we find some help, a wonderful clue from Testimonies, Volume 5, pages 464 and 465. Here's what we read. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, aha, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. All right, do you see the parallel right now? It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Now there's something I'd like you to know here, that, notice here, that's very important. It will then be time to leave, what's it say? The large cities. Now there's something different here. You see, it's, it's as if Jerusalem was a microcosm of the end of the world, a little miniature of the end of the world. And now we have something more broad, more expansive, that when we would see the sign, we should embark on a process of leaving the large cities first. And anybody who's left the city, you know it's a process. It takes time. Leave the large cities first, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. When we would see the sign, that is what we should do. Now, what's the first step when the sign should be seen? Leave the large cities. Okay. Now, that's interesting. We could talk about what a large city was in the time that this statement was written. Los Angeles was about 100,000 people at the turn of that century, around 1900. San Francisco was around 300,000, if I remember the numbers right. And Mrs. White said that, that our people should be miles out of that city. Now, what's the population of greater Chicago area? How many millions is it? Somebody says eight million? All right, it will then be time to leave the large cities. Well, we've got to look at this because the question is, well, wait a minute, Dave. That says it refers us to the Sunday law. Well, if we're going to understand this from the Bible, how do we make that connection? Well, the siege around Jerusalem that we just studied was from Rome, the Roman armies. But all of you good Seventh-day Adventist Bible students know that there's two phases of Rome in Bible prophecy, right? What do we call that first phase? Pagan Rome. And that was Cestius and Titus, those generals, that was under pagan Rome. But I know you're a bunch of good Bible students here. You also know, and even the historians tell us, that pagan Rome handed the scepter to who? Papal Rome. And we find this prophecy in Revelation chapter 13 that lays this out. Gives us 11 points of identification for this beast in Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10. And it gives us in those 11 points a perfect description of the papacy. In fact, that is the only world power that fits all 11 points. One of those is that he receives his power and his seat from who? Somebody says the dragon, the devil. That's right. In Revelation chapter 12, there was that great red dragon. And we know that represents Satan. And we also know, as you study the prophecy there, that it represents the activities of Satan through pagan Rome. Because it was at the time that that child would be born, remember? Who would rule with a rod of iron. Who was that child? It was Jesus. That was pagan Rome ruling in the time of Jesus. And now that power and that seat and that authority are now given to this beast that represents the papacy. Now, <clears throat> this gets interesting because if we ask ourselves, what is the standard of papal Rome? What would their flag be that they would plant showing their intentions? You know what I love is that the Lord is so good to us he gives us His Word. He's blessed us with His Word through the Holy Scriptures, through the spirit of prophecy. But we find that even the beast will tell you what their sign is. You see, the word 
standard is a banner or a sign, right? And I think you all have heard this before, good Bible students that you are, that sign can be used interchangeably with another wor word in the Bible, and that's a mark, a sign or a mark. Now, here's what's amazing, is that the beast has a sign or a mark, a sign of its authority. It's its flag, if you will, its banner, its standard. And what's amazing is the beast will tell you what that sign is, what that mark is. Now, I don't recommend that we learn our lessons from the beast, but I just think it's amazing that the Lord doesn't want anyone to go without having ample opportunity to understand the truth. So he allows the beast to identify themselves. Isn't the Lord good? Listen to this. This is from a Catholic source. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. It's talking about the change of the Sabbath. And the act is a what? Mark of her... Isn't it amazing they use the word? The beast uses the word, tells us what the mark is. The act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Here's another one, Catholic source. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. From the Catholic Record, September 1, 1923. Now you say, but wait a minute. There in Testimonies, Volume 5, we read that the assumption of power on the part of our nation. How does our nation get into the picture? Well, if we keep reading in Revelation chapter 13, here's what we read. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. Verse 11. Now, which power in the world is this talking about? The United States of America. We just sent a CD out. We send a CD out every month, a wake-up message to folks that are on our mailing list. We just sent one out a couple months back called The Voice of the Dragon. Friends, it's speaking like a dragon right before our eyes. It's happening. We're seeing the fulfillment of these things. And we go on and read that this beast, this second beast, United States, exercises all the power of the first beast before it. Now, it's true. The first beast is before the second beast. That's obvious. But there's something more. If you look at the Greek there, it means before it <coughs> geographically. In other words, in his presence. He, in other words, he's the front man for the first beast. The United States, the front man for the papacy. That's right. That's what's being predicted here. And that's what we're seeing, by the way. Now, we've already stated what that sign or that standard is, Sunday sacredness. And you say, but wait a minute. The Sunday law hasn't been passed. Pastor Dave, you already said that the sign has come, but the Sunday law hasn't been passed. How does that work? Well, this is where we have to go back and look at history, but before we do that, I want to show you how I discovered this. And I believe we need the gift of prophecy as a people. It's not just something nice to have. It is a necessity to the people of God, and I praise God for it. And I found something in my study in the spirit of prophecy that absolutely changed our lives. It just rocked my world. And it has to do with a little pamphlet called Country Living. How many of you have that little pamphlet? There's quite a few hands here. Very good. And if you don't have it, you can go to our website, www.backtoenoch.org. And you can download a copy of that. Now, I was reading through this little pamphlet, and there's something that bothered me a little bit. I found general statements about the benefits of country living. I found statements that indicate that the time was coming that we should leave. I found other statements that seemed to indicate the time had come and I was a little confused. I was wondering what is what's going on here? Why do I find this mix of statements in the spirit of prophecy in that little pamphlet country living? And I was pondering this one day. I was I still remember I was driving around in my car and a thought came into my mind, and I believe the Lord was trying to help me out. And the thought was this. Maybe you should take the little booklet, Country Living, apart 
and lay those statements out in chronological order as to when they were written and see if a, if a harmonious pattern might emerge. And I thought, well, that would be very interesting. And I'm sorry to say I forgot about that for a few days. And, and uh, I was in the conference office one day waiting for an appointment. And it was as if the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder and reminded me about that little project. And I had some time, so I ran downstairs to the ABC, and I, I asked the manager, do you have a country living? And sure enough, there was one on the shelf, one left. And I went and I grabbed it, and I flipped to the back page and here is the statement that we read just a few moments ago. You'll recognize it. On the back page of the book, Country Living, the very last page, under the heading, Emergency Flight and Closing Conflict. Now, that heading was not provided by Mrs. White. It's the editors put that there. And uh, I'm not trying to suggest something sinister. I'm just pointing that out so you keep it in mind. But here is the statement that we read on the last page. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. You recognize it? Here we go. I'm going to read it through. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Now, I'm just going to put a few phrases up here so we keep them in mind as we go on. It started with the words, what? The time is not far distant. And then we saw it would then be time. My eyes dropped to the bottom of the page there in Country Living, and the date was there, 1885. You know, it turns out that this is one of the earlier statements on Country Living that's in the whole book. And it's on the last page. I flipped back a few pages. Now, please keep this in mind. I don't want to be too laborious here, but I want you to notice these phrases. So you can see what happened to me as I was standing in the ABC that day. The time is not far distant. It will then be time. I flipped back a few pages, and my eyes fell on these words. The time has come. When as God opens the way, Families should move out of the cities. The children should be taken into the country. I looked at the date. It was 1903. Are you catching where we're going with this? Something happened between 1885 and 1903 that caused the prophet to go from saying, the time is not far distant, to what? The time has come. Something happened. I kept looking. I found this statement. This was 1906. Notice the heat's cranking up. Out of the cities. Out of the cities. This is the message the Lord has been giving me. The earthquakes will come. The floods will come. And we are not to establish ourselves in the wicked cities. I tell you, I got chill bumps. I was seeing the pattern already, and I hadn't even done the whole project of taking this little booklet apart. By the way, if you get Country Living off our webpage, you can download it as a PDF. You can read it on the webpage, or you can download it. It's in chronological order. We took the statements and put them in chronological order for you. All right. But I kept looking, and then the window began to narrow. I was looking for when was it? When was the sign that would cause the prophet from going to the time is not far distant to the time has come? And the window began to close. Look at this one. This is very important. You can also find this in 6T, Testimonies, Volume 6, page 195. What's it say? Get out of the large cities as fast as possible. You know when that was written? 1900. Why is that significant? Because Mrs. White told us when you see the sign, what's the first step? Leave the large cities. 1900, she said, get out of the large cities as fast as possible. Something happened between 1885 and 1900. And I kept looking. And the window narrowed down even more. I found an amazing statement. Before I read it to you, I want to take you back to the statement in Great Controversy that explains those Roman standards around the walls of the city so you can see the language because the parallel is impossible to miss when you look at this up close. Page 26, again, the Great Controversy. When the idolatrous standards, notice this, the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be what? Set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. Now, let this ring in your ears, okay? Watch this. 
Letter 90, 1897. The Protestant world have, what? Set up an idol Sabbath. Do you see the language? The Lord is so good. It's, it's almost identical language. The Protestant world have set up an idol Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be, and, f- and they are treading in the footsteps of the papacy. If you keep reading, it says, For this reason I see the necessity of the people of God getting out of the cities. Wow, 1897, that's only 12 years after 1885. The question is, what happened between 1885 and 1897? What was the sign? Where was it? Something told me in the back of my mind that 1888 was an important year for more than just Minneapolis. And so I started to dig around, and what I found was, to me, quite amazing. Because in 1888, Senator H.W. Blair from New Hampshire brought a bill into Congress, which, if passed, would be the first federal Sunday law in the history of the United States. We call it now the Blair Bill. The Blair Bill. Now when that happened, that was 1888, just a mere three years, a little less than three years after that statement had been made, comparing the siege of Jerusalem with this other issue of the enforcement of the Sunday law. And you can imagine that as Seventh-day Adventists we got upset, a little uptight, and sent Jones, A.T. Jones, who at that time was the editor of American Sentinel, which we now call Liberty Magazine. That was American Sentinel back then. And Jones went back to represent the church to oppose the passing of the Blair Bill. There was another Sabbath-keeping minister also who went. And together they testified before this congressional committee, and indeed the Sunday law wasn't passed. But you say, well, wait a minute, it wasn't passed. Now this is where history is so important. Because our parallel that we're looking at is the siege around Jerusalem, right? But we've got to remember something important. The siege around Jerusalem happened how many times? Twice. Now let me ask you something. When Cestius came with his armies there the first time and surrounded Jerusalem, did the abomination of desolation desolate the city? No. They made their intentions known, didn't they? And then there was a retreat of the Roman armies. That was the sign to leave. Let me ask you something else. When the Romans left, were their intentions of coming back and taking the city any less? we can safely say no because they came back, right? And they took the city about three and a half years later. Now, let's consider our own day. You see where this is going, don't you? Friends, if there were two sieges around Jerusalem, I expect two sieges in the last days. What we're saying is this, the first siege already came. I believe the Blair Bill was the launching of the first siege. Now here is is the dilemma that troubles my soul, that most Seventh-day Adventists know that this Sunday law is the sign to leave the cities, but they think it's in the future. They think it's when it actually finally comes to fruition. But you see, the first siege around Jerusalem didn't go to full fruition. It was the second siege. The first siege was the sign to leave. And friends, the first siege was already launched over a hundred years ago. And somebody says, well, that's a long time. Well, we serve a merciful God. He gave 120 years of preaching to the people in the days of Noah, right? Do you think he'd do any less for us? He wants us to understand, and he sent the sign. And here's why it troubles me even more, because I hear the rumble of the return of the Roman armies. You can be sure of one thing. Just like pagan Rome, they never changed their mind when they retreated. They didn't change their mind. They got derailed for a while. They never thought for once they weren't going to take Jerusalem. They just Something else came up. They knew they'd be back. Friends, it's the same in our day. Make no mistake about it. The forces that tried to get that Sunday law passed in 1888, not only are they still at work today, they've never stopped working. In fact, it's safe to say this. 
The Sunday law has been in the process of being passed for over 100 years. They've been working all along. Let me tell you something. i got a friend who subscribes to the Lord's Day Alliance. Are you familiar with the Lord's Day Alliance? That's an organization that's interested in passing Sunday law legislation, by the way, interested in exonerating what they call the Christian Sunday Sabbath or Sunday sacredness. They're based in Atlanta, Georgia. My friend received a letter because he's on their mailing list. He received a letter in December of 2001, right after the infamous 9-11. By the way, we posted this letter on our webpage. You can see a copy of it yourself. You know what he said? In this letter, the director there of Lord's Day Alliance told all the supporters that the events of 9-11, particularly in the Capitol there in New York City, had brought us to a new opportunity to lift up Sunday sacredness. It was a new opportunity for the Lord's Day Alliance to get to work and promote the Christian Sunday. But here's what really got my attention. I dropped to the bottom of the letter, and on the letter with their address and all that, here is the logo, serving the church's and the nation since 1888. Friends, the Roman armies launched a siege once. And yes, there was a retreat because over the years the issue subsided. But friends, they're coming back. You've all heard of Dies Domini, right? A letter from the Pope, an encyclical, the previous Pope, calling for Sunday, the promotion of Sunday sacredness. Are you familiar with the New Catholic Catechism? I, I guess I could still call it new. It's over 10 years old now. But it's the first, as far as I know, unabridged, complete catechism in the English language. And I think you can read it on the Internet. It's very interesting. If you go to the Ten Commandments, you have to go to the Third Commandment because you know what they did to the Ten Commandments. Took the one out about idols and... That made the fourth commandment become the third, obviously. And everybody knows there's got to be ten commandments, so they split the last one in two to keep ten. So you have to go to the third commandment, and what you find is that the previous pope, in that Catholic catechism, he called for Sunday legislation clear back then. Friends, the Roman armies are coming. And it's time for us to wake up. We've been in a window of opportunity, and that window is closing. And Mrs. White had this to say, ere long there will be such strife and confusion in the cities that many who wish to leave them will not be able to do so. You see, this is what just spurs me on, is I believe that there are Seventh-day Adventists living in these major metropolitan centers who are not just going to have hardship. They may witness the death of their own family members and children. Why? Unnecessarily. Because they didn't heed the warning. God would not have it so. He gave us a warning, didn't he? You know, we had another warning a few years ago. I have a friend, an attorney, who called me one day. And I hadn't talked to him for quite a while, and I found out that he had been working for a company that was based at the World Trade Center. And you know, there was a lot of talk about Testimonies, Volume 9. Do you remember this? Right after... 9-11. In Testimonies, Volume 9, there was quite a description. The buildings rising higher and higher, and then the fire engines were not able to be operated. Remember that? And there was really a split among Adventism that I saw. Many Seventh-day Adventists said, hey, this is not a fulfillment. This is spectacularism. We shouldn't be opportunizing on these statements. Others were saying, this is a fulfillment. By the way, I believe that was a fulfillment. But I don't think it's the only fulfillment we're going to see. I think there's more coming. That was just a little tiny taste. I asked my friend, Nick. I said, what do you think about the statements in Volume 9? wanted his opinion. He said, Dave, it's more than that. It starts in Testimonies, Volume 9, on page 11. 9 11. The Lord is so good, isn't he? He doesn't want us to miss it. And then he told me an interesting story. He said, you know, he was supposed to be in the buildings, and normally he would have been, but he was out 
doing some errands, and he watched this whole thing unfold from the streets of New York City. And I said, what was it like? He said, it was apocalyptic. And then he told me this story. He said he had a couple friends that were at the general conference, and they were, of course, wondering about Nick. What happened to him? How was he faring? And they were watching the news unfold, and they pulled out their laptops, and they got on the CD-ROM, and they were reading statements. And they came to a very interesting statement. This is found in Manuscript Releases, Volume 11, starting on page 361. In the night, I was, I thought, in a room, but not in my own house. I was in a city where I knew not. And I heard expression after expression. I rose up quickly in bed and saw from my window large balls of fire. Jetting out were sparks in the form of arrows, and buildings were being consumed. And in a very few minutes, the entire block of buildings was falling. And the screeching and mournful groans came distinctly to my ears. I cried out in my raised position to learn what was happening. Where am I? And where are our family circle? Then I awoke. But I could not tell where I was, for I was in another place than home. I said, O oh Lord, where am I? And what shall I do? It was a voice that spoke, Be not afraid. Nothing shall harm you. I was instructed that destruction hath gone forth upon cities. The word of the Lord will be fulfilled. And now, Isaiah 29, 19 to 24, was repeated. I dared not move, not knowing where I was. I cried unto the Lord, What does it mean? These representations of destruction were repeated. Where am I? In scenes I have represented that which will be, but warn my people to cease from putting their trust in men who are not obedient. She goes on to quote a little more, and then she says this. These words were given me from Isaiah 30. Now, when the prophet says, what does it mean? Keep in mind, she just saw buildings. She saw buildings collapsing. And she asked the Lord, what does it mean? Now, when the prophet asks, what does it mean? And the Lord reads a scripture, I want to know what that scripture is. How about you? All right. It's found in Isaiah chapter 30. You want to turn there? Isaiah chapter 30. Now, it's interesting to me. The Lord read to her up through verse 15. Let's pick it up right at verse 15. By the way, I believe the Lord wants us to keep reading. He pointed us in the right direction for something amazing. Verse 15, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. I'll warn you right now, this out of the city's message is kind of unpopular. A lot of people think you're, going to, you're crazy if you're going to follow this. This is this verse. In returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and confidence. Oh, I wish some of you, uh, I, wish, I wish I could take all of you. You're welcome. To my home. I'm going home tomorrow night. And it's quiet. We've been staying here close by and I hear that train come through all the time. But I praise God for that because we're coming to the city to warn people of what's happening. But friends, I wish I could take you home. You hear the birds. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. Why is it that we resist that which God wants to give to us? Keep reading. But she said, no, we will flee upon horses. No, no, Pastor Dave, we'll get out. It's premature. Don't worry now. We'll have time. We'll flee upon horses. We got cars. Therefore shall ye flee. We'll ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. Verse 17. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign on a hill. Now I'm going to drop down to verse 25. And there shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hill, rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. The whole world knew of those buildings at the Trade Center as the towers. We heard it over and over again in the news, the towers, Tower 1, Tower 2, the towers. No coincidence. I've heard people say that the Lord didn't predict that in the Bible. 
I read in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, that the Lord God doeth nothing but what? He revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. Friends, this is a warning to us. It's a warning to God's people in the cities. Get out. Get out. Time is running out. And you say, but wait, what, what's this mean? There should be rivers and streams of water. Hey, it's true. The water's a lot cleaner. A friend of mine said one day after he got a nice swig of water in one of these cities, oh, I just got my daily dose of chemicals. That mountain spring and mountain well water, there's nothing like it. But what does this mean? There's something deeper here. I invite you to turn to John chapter 7, starting at verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What does this symbolize? Well, the Bible tells us. Look at verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Preacher, are you saying that it's only those who obey the warning and leave the cities are going to receive that outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Friends, God's blessings that He bestows are on condition of obedience. That's what I read in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. It's on God's terms. You say, what about me? The Lord will help you, friend. The Lord has a place for you. The Lord will get you. You out. If people say, well, I don't know, you don't know my situation. I don't know your situation. You don't know my situation either. But you know what? If the Lord helped me get out, He can help you get out. He has a place for you. I want to take a few minutes to just show you our place that the Lord had for us. I don't have time to go through the whole story, but my wife made a list. She had a long list, and she took things out of the Bible. The Old Testament, where the Lord promised His people, I'll give you wells you did not dig, and orchards you did not plant, and houses you did not build. And she had all this stuff on her list. And I was saying, boy, that's an awful lot. And she said, well, it couldn't hurt. And the Lord led us to a beautiful place in the mountains in northeast Washington State. She had put on her list, I want some mountain views, mountain vistas, and meadows. And the Lord truly blessed looking out our front yard. This is our little orchard, about 50 trees, and we got 100 blueberry bushes that were just loaded this year, and we have cherries and apricots and plums and pears and peaches and nectarines. The Lord is so good. And you know, there's something that is very special to me, and I call it my Enoch Walk. Our property borders National Forest Land. And there's a little trail I like to hike up. And this is a picture from my Enoch Walk. And it's not a man-made trail. It's a trail that was made by the deer and some stray cows. And there's not a time that I go on that walk. I don't think about Enoch communing with the Lord. And we're promised that there would be times that our hearts would thrill within us as one comes nigh to commune with us as he did with Enoch. Friend, the Lord has an Enoch Walk for you. This is sunset out our front door. The Lord has a place for you. Let me read a promise to you. God will help his people to find such homes outside the cities. You want to know where yours is? How about we pray about it? How many of you want to get out? How many of you want to find that home in the country? Praise the Lord. Look at those hands. Let's kneel together and pray because God has a place for you. Would you kneel with me? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, it's you who is calling us out of the cities. It's in the Bible. It's in the testimonies, the testimonies, the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. It's Jesus calling us to come out. And I'm told that he who has called us is faithful who also will do it. Lord, bless each one here with a desire in their heart to follow you. I pray that the Spirit of God would move upon hearts today and help them to know that you will help them to find that place. Lord, I pray that each one would study these things out. As time is running out, Lord, bless each one to be fervent, to decide to act on the warnings from our loving Savior. 
And bless each one, and I pray, Lord, that there will be many powerful testimonies of those who have followed the counsel. Testimonies of how you've opened the way before them and brought them to that place. And Lord, this is for one important reason, that our hearts would be so prepared that we could be used as instruments to take this final message to a world that's dying to hear it. Please help us and bless us to this end, I pray in Jesus' name. In this DVD presentation, I've endeavored to present the evidence from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that it is now time to get out of the cities. Friends, this is an urgent message. Yet God would not have us make rash moves. The Bible teaches, let everything be done decently and in order. There are six important steps that we must follow to be sure we move forward as quickly as possible and also in a wise manner that God can bless. There are also important questions that we didn't have time to address in this first DVD. For example, is this council really for everyone? Didn't Ellen White say that some should move into the cities to evangelize them? Should we move to smaller cities now? Or is it time to move to the mountains? How small is small enough? How far out of the cities should we be? On our second DVD, entitled Out of the Cities Part 2, will answer these and more questions and share the important steps necessary to get out of the cities. Thank you for joining us for this study, and may God bless you.